All right, we're going to talk about um, some topics in chemistry that you're not really responsible for, but it gives you a pretty good background, and it is a good review of the first year, the uh, pre-diploma chemistry course. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about is just the atomic theory of matter. How did we get um, from the idea back in Greek times with the Greek philosopher Democritus from the idea that all matter is made up of fire, water, earth, and wind um, to the idea that the atom is the building block of matter. Um, Dalton uh, was the one who, uh, by the way, Democritus was the one with the idea um, that, uh, I wish I wrote better, Democritus, Greek philosopher, really credited with the first idea of the atom. And his thought was if you take a sample of, say, sand and keep cutting it in half, eventually you're going to get to the smallest part that still retains the properties of sand or the original material. Right? But then this idea of that atom reemerged in the early 19th century by John Dalton. Now remember, back in the 19th century, the century they are going to have limited instrumentation. They really kind of just have a mass balance to work with, right? So most of this in that time was really limited on what they could discover by the equipment that they had available at the time. But John Dalton um, kind of took this idea of atoms and said that the, all matter is made up of atoms, and these atoms can combine to form molecules or ionic compounds um, as we know them today. But remember back then, they didn't have the understanding of atoms that you've pretty much grown up with. Okay, so Dalton's postulates. First one, uh, each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. He also went on to say that all atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and other properties, but the atoms of one element are different from the atoms of the other. Now, this is not quite true, and it comes down to this word, okay? And it really has to do with isotopes that we'll get to in a moment, right? Um, but hopefully you know that atoms of oxygen are very different than atoms of hydrogen. Okay, oops. Another one of his postulates, atoms of an element are not changed into atoms of a different element by chemical means. And this, this would be true if we add the word ordinary. And that's supposed to say ordinary and meaning um, not nuclear. Nuclear does change the um, element's identity uh, because the nucleus does change. All right, but in ordinary chemical reaction, atoms are neither created nor destroyed in those. They're just rearranged into different um, molecules or um, substances. And then his other postulate compounds are formed in atoms of more than one element combined, and a given compound always has the same relative number and kinds of atoms. For instance, water always has two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. That's basically what that says. Okay, and this is known as the law of definite proportion, also known as the law of constant composition. Okay, and they did this basically on a mass basis. Uh, we would more than likely just look at it from a formula. Okay. Law of conservation of mass. Mass of substances present at the end of the chemical process is the same as the mass of substances before, and that really lets us balance chemical equations. Okay. The number and type of atoms uh, as the reactants has to equal the number and type of reactants in the products. Okay. So when we balance equations, we're really just uh, making the equation obey the law of conservation of mass, or at least describing it. The electron was found through the use of um, negatively charged particles um, being emitted from a um, charged metal disc um, and it was made to do that by connecting it to a high voltage battery 
this tube is known as a cathode ray tube. It is evacuated, meaning there's a vacuum in there. There are no particles in there. When this battery was hooked up, a um, ex chemist, J.J. Uh, Thompson, um, did this experiment initially, and he found that by setting this up, you got a light ray, and this light ray was actually um, repelled by a negative plate uh, attracted to a positive plate. And he said that this negative particle, the electron, the negative particle, must be part of this metal plate. So this negative part had to be part of matter. If matter is made up of atoms, that negative part had to have come from an atom. And he was able to measure the charge to mass ratio of the electron. Um, and found it to be 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. Not that that number is really anything that you need to, to concern yourself with. Millikan then took J.J. Thompson's results and ran what's known as the oil drop experiment. And basically, since J.J. Thompson found the charge to mass ratio of the electron, if you could find either the charge or the mass, you would know the other ones. So Millikan set up this experiment. He determined the charge of the electron in 1909 and hence was able to find the mass of the electron from J.J. Thompson's results. Okay. Um, kind of a random little topic on radioactivity. It's the spontaneous emission of radiation by an atom. It was first observed by Henri Becquerel. Marie and Pierre Curie also studied it. Okay, three types of radiation were discovered by a man, Ernest Rutherford, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. He had a lead block, radioactive substance inside, and he had charged plates. From the path of these rays, he determined that the beta ray was negative, the gamma ray was neutral, and the alpha ray was positive. The amount of deflection also showed him that this alpha ray was heavier than the beta ray, or beta particle. Kind of jumping back to Thompson, um, after his uh, experiments and the results, he put forth his theory that the atom was like a pudding of positive charge with electric or negative bits scattered throughout it. Those negative bits were the electron. And I don't know if it shows it. His thought was that these electrons were able to pop out of this positively charged pudding and make that cathode ray that he saw in his cathode ray tube experiment. So, now that they've discovered the electron, Ernest Rutherford actually put together his famous gold foil experiment, hoping to confirm J.J. Thompson's theory of that plum pudding model. Um, however, he, well, let's first look at his experiment. He had a source of alpha particles, okay, positively charged, particles and what he saw were most of the alpha rays went right through and this was actually the um, what he expected all the rays to go right through right because it was this diffuse positive charge throughout that positive pudding in that plum pudding model um, but what he found were some were scattered okay and almost coming back at the source. And this did not support Thompson's model of the atom. So Rutherford had to come up with a different model of the atom to explain his results. And he is credited with actually finding the positively charged nucleus. And what he envisioned was um, atoms with a positively charged uh, nucleus. 
Okay, and this was your nucleus. Positively charged, concentrated at the center of the atom uh, with a lot of empty space around that nucleus so that most of the alpha particles, that's what these things are, were able to go straight through. However, if they happen to come close to the nucleus, this concentrated positive charge, they would be deflected. Okay, and that's what you see going on in some of these cases. Okay, and his new model of the atom explained some of his results. Okay, and again, Rutherford postulated a very small dense nucleus with the electrons around the outside of the atom. The two charged particles in the atom were the easiest, quote unquote, to find uh, because they were charged and you could use charged particles or charged plates to determine them. Right. Protons specifically were discovered by Rutherford later, and then neutrons discovered a while later by a man, James Chadwick, in 1932. Further um, experiments showed that the mass and atomic mass units of a proton and a neutron are relatively the same mass with the electron being about 2,000 times smaller, so usually the mass of the electron and any calculation is ignored. Okay, moving on to symbols of elements. You should be familiar, familiar with most of the symbols of the elements. They're symbolized by one or two letters. You should know most of them. If you see a number in the front, lower, that is the atomic number, protons, atomic number which is equal to the number of protons and electrons for a neutral atom. It is represented by the symbol Z. The mass number, which is the number of protons plus neutrons in atomic mass units, um, is the total number of protons and neutrons in that particular isotope. Remember, isotopes are atoms of the same element that have different masses. That decimal number that you see in the periodic table is the average of all the naturally occurring isotopes. So these are four different isotopes of carbon. Note that the atomic number is the same. The mass number changes because the number of neutrons changes. The number, the, the mass of each isotope is different as well. We'll talk about a mass spectrometer um, later, um, but you can measure atomic and molecular masses of isotopes using a mass spectrometer. Okay. Average mass is what we use in calculations because remember we're using a huge amount of atoms and molecules when we're talking about real um, measurable quantities of a substance okay. and that average mass is the weighted average of uh, their isotopes. Moving into the periodic table, it's a beautiful thing. It's a systematic catalog of the elements. There are different regions that you should be familiar with. You should know by now that the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number. They are also arranged due to a repeating pattern of reactivities. Um, if you look at the chemical properties, rows on the periodic table, and that means things that go this way, are called periods. Columns or groups, this is this way. Okay, elements in the same group have similar chemical properties, and this is, hopefully you remember, related to the number of valence electrons. There are some groups that you should know. Not so much this one. Alkaline metals group one, alkaline earth metals group two, halogens group seven or 17, and noble gases are group 18. Okay. Hopefully you remember nonmetals are on the right with the exception of hydrogen. Metalloids are the stair step. 
and then metals are on the left side of the periodic table. Most of the periodic table is made up of metals. You should know how to write chemical formulas. And hopefully you remember that the number subscript tells you how many of that atom is in the molecule. Molecular compounds are almost always made up of nonmetals. And we'll find uh, over the course of the next two years that there is a lot of gray um, in those, whether something is a molecular or ionic compound. There are seven atomic diatomic molecules. You need to have those memorized. All right. And then we're going to get into types of formulas, and that will be a, another screencast.